I'm sure that no one has forgotten how last school year started in the midst of the pandemic. And a lot of teachers are really excited about this upcoming school year because we're ready for a fresh start and a new year. But I just wanna let you know that it's possible that if you don't do things right, that this school year could look a lot like last school year. In this video, I'm gonna share with you three tips that to start off this school year right in a post-pandemic school. And make sure that you stick around to the end because I got some resources for you. What's going on everybody and welcome to the Pursuit of Excellence family. If we're just meeting, my name is Daryl Williams and I'm here to help you develop students' life skills, mindset, and character. All right, I'm gonna dive right into it. I have three tips on the how to start this school year off right in a post-pandemic school. The first tip is to make sure that we start with rules and procedures. Rules and procedures is something that we've been talked about since the beginning of time. But it's so important that I want to make sure that I put this first because last year it was hard to start with policies and procedures. It was really difficult because we didn't know what the policies and procedures were ourselves. Like if you remember coming into August, September, whenever you started the school year, there was still a lot of uncertainty around how school was going to run. So we still had mandates coming down from the district. We still had the state making decisions. We still had, you know, policymakers who had never been in a classroom making rules about education. You know how that goes. And they were coming out with these policies and these procedures, which I guess, I guess when you think about it, it made sense from a health standpoint. But when you think about how practical it was in the school building, it was, there were some head scratchers, right? And we weren't really confident on to how the school year was gonna look. So since we weren't confident, it was hard to portray that to families and to students. So it was hard to come up with procedures on things that we had no idea of how to do. So this year, we have a better opportunity to start off the year strong and really nail down policies and procedures. Because even if this year still looks weird, like we still have some people that are gonna be virtual, some some students are re-entering into the building, some are still doing some hybrid situations. So even though this year is can still look potentially weird, I think that we are in a better position to navigate these things so that we can really get out ahead of it and not have to wait for things to arise to come up with a procedure on how to deal with it. But now we've seen some things, we have a little bit of experience, we can put some procedures into place. And it's really hard to think about everything. It's really hard to think about all the procedures that you will need in your classroom. So I linked down below an article that I found written by one Miss Janelle Cox, and it is awesome. It really gives you a lot of ideas to think about what policies I'm gonna have in my classroom. It's a checklist of questions that you can ask yourself to develop policies for your classroom. And I'm not gonna go through the whole article, but a few of my favorite things that she mentioned are to determine what your attention getters are gonna be like. How am I gonna get the class's attention when they're all doing independent work or where they're all working on something and I need their attention really quickly? Uh, what is that signal, what is that sign going to be? Another thing that I really like is to practice what room transitions look like. How are we gonna line up to go to lunch? How are we gonna transition to electives or specials? Or how are we even gonna move about the classroom from um, this portion of the lesson to that portion of the lesson or from this workspace to that workspace? So really, student movement, you know, what is that gonna look like? And another one that I really like is to teach students what to do if they finish work early. So if I finish my work early, you know, do I flick the person next to me? You know, do I get up and wander around the classroom or do you have something for me to do? And what this really does by setting policies and procedures ahead of time is it's going to eliminate a lot of the excuses. It's gonna eliminate a lot of the misbehaviors. It's gonna eliminate a lot of confusion and really help students just be more comfortable in your classroom. And the reason why procedures are so important is because when we don't have procedures, what essentially we're saying is we're allowing for students to decide what is best for them in that moment. Like we're allowing students as a situation arise in their six, seven, eight year old minds or 10, 11, 12 year old minds, we're allowing them to say, hmm, I'm not sure what to do in this moment, but I think I should do this. And a lot of times what they choose and what the teachers would prefer to see is not aligned. So by thinking through a lot of these situations that could potentially arise and putting policies and procedures in place, you'll save yourself a lot of headache and be able to maximize instructional time throughout the school year. And my pro tip before I get to tip number two, my pro tip on this one is to really I want you to go through the day in the life of a student living in your classroom. Like I want you to exit your classroom and to walk back into it as if you're a student on the first day and write down the questions that you need to answer with every move that you make. So when you approach the door, where am I gonna sit? 
right? That's question number one. Once you get to your seat, uh, what do I do with my belongings? Am I gonna put it under my desk? Is there somewhere in the back for me to put it? You know, that's a question that you have to answer. And you have to think about student movement. If I have to go to the bathroom, what should I do? So these are the ways that you can start to create the policies and procedures in your classroom. I really want you to take whatever time it takes, two, three hours to just go through the day in your class as a student and really, really see what it is um, that they would come up with so that you can create procedures to guide them and how to maneuver in your classroom. Tip number two is to build relationships. Relationship building is important at any time in the school year, but especially as we start off the year. And last year, this might be something that we didn't get a chance to do as much as we wanted to because we had to focus on a lot of other things like i mentioned earlier so this year don't make that same mistake we still have to focus on a lot of other things but make sure that you prioritize building relationships because when you build relationships with students especially in a year like this building relationships builds trust and when they build trust then you can work together towards a common vision that you have that's really hard to do with students who don't like or trust you so make sure that you are focusing in on building relationships and i know that last year looked a little bit weird as we were trying to navigate whether it was virtual or we were in person but just with different restrictions but now we're a lot more familiar with navigating those spaces so we can definitely build relationships better than we did last year and if i could tell a little bit story about myself real quick once the pandemic hit and I figured there was just so much going on, I had to strip it down to basics. And I thought that the basics were curriculum, instruction, and assessment. How are my students gonna get resources? How am I gonna make sure that they are seeing the content that I'm putting out there for them? And how can I assess to make sure that they're actually doing it and that they are growing? But those are not the basics. The basics are showing students how much you care about them and their future, and that you're willing to support them along the journey. That, that's the basics of education, right? And building relationships fit so cleanly into them because it shows students how much I care about you, how much I love you, and that you can trust me. And together, we're gonna be along this journey. Even if it's not an easy one, I'm there with you by your side. So building relationships is super, super important. And tip number three, this is my favorite, to really make sure that we start this year off right. We've got to set smarter goals. And you are familiar with goal setting. You probably heard of SMART goals before. SMART ER goals is a little bit different, but we've got to set smarter goals. See, last year we may not have started off with setting smarter goals because we were focused on how to maneuver in the pandemic. And this year, we could fall into that same trap because we're focusing so much on closing the achievement gap that we might feel like we need to dive directly into content and we don't have time for some of this extra stuff. But I wanna urge you to remember that you can't focus on closing the achievement gap without one of the main components that are necessary to close that gap. And that's empowering students. I'm gonna put it like this. Uh, the other day, my wife asked me to make some rice. And I mean, we have a rice cooker, so that's, that's a simple task, right? I haven't made rice on the stove since I was like 12. And I said, I can go ahead and, I, and I'll do it. So I, I went in the kitchen and I, I put the rice in the rice cooker. I put the water in the rice cooker. I put some seasoning in the rice cooker. Kind of shifted up a little bit, you know, can't have no plain rice out here. So I did that. And then I went on about my business. And then a couple of, I'm going to say about an hour or so later, my wife came to me and she was like, then I asked you to make the rice. I was like, whoa, 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 calm it down. Coming in kind of hot. Like, you know when you have that confidence because you know you did the thing? Like, like, listen, relax. I made the rice. It's okay. And she's like, no, you didn't. I was like, yo, I definitely, I definitely made the rice. Like, what do you mean? So both of us go in the kitchen together. And when we get there, um, I see the rice cooker. I do. I see the rice cooker. And when I opened it, inside was just this swelled, soggy rice that had been sitting in cold water and seasoning because I never turned it on. And some of you see where I'm going with this. Listen, we're trying to focus on closing the achievement gap. And we're, you know, buying new curriculums. We're focusing on getting resources. Maybe some of our schools are employing some more tutors or facilitators because we're really trying to focus in on how am I gonna close this achievement gap? Because we care about students and we want this gap to close. And all these ingredients are nice and, and, and necessary, but the most necessary component to activate all these ingredients is that you gotta empower the student. Like we can put all the ingredients in the rice cooker, but if we don't turn on, we don't have rice. You can put all these ingredients into the school year, but if you don't empower the students, you're not gonna have the growth. 
that you desire. So setting smarter goals does three things. I promise I can talk about setting smarter goals for like hours. So I'm really gonna try to make this short because I don't wanna make this video too long. Setting smarter goals does three things. One, it increases student buy-in. Two, it helps students to organize a plan to achieve throughout the school year. And three, it helps students to chart their progress. Number one, it creates buy-in because students are invested in this goal now. And buy-in is important because students don't just show up and work because you ask them to. Students are wondering what's in it for me. But by developing and designing a goal with them, now students have something to look forward to and they're more engaged and they're ready to perform and they're willing to struggle because now they have something that they're that is worth the struggle, that they perceive is worth the struggle. Number two, like I said, it helps them to devise a plan because when you have the goal, now the teacher and the students can reverse engineer what it takes to get there. And when you're developing smarter goals, if you don't know much about smarter goals, I'll link a video at the end of this one. But when you're developing smarter goals, it actually really helps you create a clear pathway to achieving it. So you're not just arbitrarily going throughout the school year day by day and hoping for the best, but you really have a clear plan and vision to achieve it. That's super, super important. And lastly, lastly, it really helps you to check the progress along the way because we have a big vision of closing this achievement gap. Right? We have a big dream of all students uh, mastering the content, but sometimes those can be so big and so overwhelming. Just like somebody else asked, you know, how do you eat an elephant? It's one bite at a time. And what Setting Smarter Goals does is it allows you to take those bite-sized chunks to maneuver throughout the school year and allows students to see those little successes and those small wins and to encourage themselves to keep going and really build that intrinsic motivation. So as promised, I have a resource for you in the description below, a resource that I created about setting smarter goals. Now this resource that I've linked is one lesson, it's self-paced, it's digital or print, and what it allows for students to do is to develop a smarter goal and follow through. So it breaks down the acronym S-M-A-R-T-E-R with short videos by me. I always keep the student videos short, about two minutes. And then they answer questions related to the videos that really helps them develop what a smarter goal is, but it gets really specific about them and their goals. So go ahead and check it out because I think it's something that your students can really, really, really benefit from. Honestly, it's probably the thing that I'm most proud of creating and I really uh, think that your students will benefit from it. There's also a freebie linked in the description below that is just a one pager that helps students develop their thoughts so that they can create a smarter goal. So go ahead and check that out. It's also in the description below. Both of the resources are really excellent, especially for those of us who are invested in goal setting. It's an awesome introduction to smarter goals. And I want to make sure that your students use it because I think that it will really, really, really help us set up to have the greatest school year ever. I'm believing it. It's the greatest school year ever. So the Pursuit Excellence moment today is to comment down below. What one thing are you going to do to make sure that you start this school year off right? And I want you to comment that down below because I want to be inspired by it. But I also want for the rest of the Pursuit of Excellence family to see it, be inspired, be encouraged, because I want us all to win. And I want us all to have the growth that our students deserve. In the next video, we're going to dive into Smarter Goals More and developing student mindset. So make sure that you subscribe so that you can catch that video once it releases. And in the meantime, I'd like for you to check out this video right here because it dives all the way into setting smarter goals, especially if that's new to you, it really develops it. And then this video down here is something I also think that you're doing.